Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Tony Roskilly. I'm the lead of the uh, network page two. Um, that's the Hydrogen Field Transportation and Network Plus, funded by EPSRC. Um, the, the role of the network is to um, uh, foster research and, and development in the area of hydrogen field transportation. Um, this is the seminar is part of that uh, uh, ongoing process. Uh, we are funded to support dissemination of uh, research and development and also to um, fund uh, research um, projects in this area. Um, so um, thank you for joining um, us today. So we have um, two speakers uh, today. Um, we're going to start off with Beth Dawson of Fuel Cell Systems, Beth, a major uh, project manager for Fuel Cell Systems Limited. She's responsible for leading all commercial projects, including off-grid solutions, hydrogen refueling, mode home fuel cell, marine fuel cells. Beth, are you able to uh, take over? I am indeed. Thank you very much. Let me uh, end that one. Righty, is are we up? Can everyone see that? Okay. I'm yes, it's fine. Yes. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you so much. All right. So I'm Beth Dawson, uh, major projects manager at Fuel Cell Systems. I'm hopeful that I'm not going to be repeating too much of uh, Robert's excellent presentation there. Um, but we're coming at it far more for I'd say from the the practical application of these things um, today and looking forward. Um, we've been we've been doing this for a while now, and uh, hopefully we can shed a bit of light on, um, you know, real world installations. Okay, so a little bit about us first. Um, as I mentioned, we've been in the industry for quite a while, um, over 10 years um, of doing this now. Um, our day job, if you like, is installing fuel cell systems. Um, so, and essentially what we do is we match up customer power requirements with technology from the marketplace. And then it's all about that integration and the deployment. So, you know, a, a fuel cell is a box that produces power, um, but if you just hoof it over a wall and hope, it, it probably won't work quite so well. So uh, for us, it's all about that integration um, piece. Also thinking about the fueling strategy, because uh, one of the key things about fuel cells is that they work beautifully, typically straight out the gate. Um, the issue is consistently where on earth we're gonna get the fuel from. Um, so um, we look at fueling strategy as part of that deployment and um, we also do things like certification, uh, talk to planning departments, uh, various things like that. So it's, it's about that sort of full holistic picture. So I'm, I'm really sorry if I'm going a bit basic on this. I wasn't quite sure of the audience. Um, so hydrogen itself, I mean, we've talked about the gas uh, uh, in, in Robert's presentation there, I think the key thing is that there's an abundance of it in the universe, but there's not a whole load of it um, free as a, an available gas source on this planet. Um, but it, it's usually attached to itself or something else, so hence H2 and indeed H2O for water. Um, but it's, it's readily available in multiple sources, as Robert alluded to. And another point, again, reinforcing what Robert said, is that it has been safely produced, stored and transported as part of industrial applications for more than 50 years. Um, you know, 60 million tonnes of the stuff is produced uh, globally. Sorry, I've got trains nearby. Um, uh, produced annually and, and used within industry. And um, it is well understood as a, as a molecule, as a gas, as a fuel. And it's about lifting and dropping those best practices from industry into new environments as we're moving forward. Is it safe? People do fret. I've, I've been answering a, a question on the, uh, the message boards already on this one. Yes, is, is the point on that one. It's as safe as any other transport fuel. Um, people fret about hydrogen an awful lot more than they maybe need to, um, just because it's, it's a new fuel, it's different. For some reason, they still have this thing where you hear hyd hydrogen and you think Hindenburg. But, you know, that was an air disaster over 70 years ago. So I think it's important that we, we try and move on from that. Um, and uh, appreciate hydrogen for, for what it can do for us today. Um, the key thing about hydrogen is that, you know, universe is small, is lightest molecule. And um, 
given half a chance, it is all of all of it is going that way at 45 miles an hour and not an awful lot can stop it. And it's not even a greenhouse gas. By the time it gets to the end, outside of the um, Earth stratosphere, um, it just gets whisked away by solar winds. So not a greenhouse gas. And you can use that um, that buoyancy as part of your safety strategy, which is useful. And yes, of course, it's flammable. All fuels are flammable, but it doesn't automatically explode just because it's exposed to the air. You have it, you know, there's a specific um, uh, reaction that needs to take place for, to get hydrogen to ignite. Um, so it's the, it's the same as anything. You need, um, you know, your fuel, you need your oxygen and you need a spark all in the same place at the same time. But if all of your fuel's going that way at 45 miles an hour, it's harder to complete that fire triangle than you might imagine. How's it produced? Well, we've talked quite a lot about that already. So, um, there's, uh, you can absolutely produce it by steam methane reforming. And indeed of that sort of 65 million tons I was talking about earlier, 95% of the, the world's um, hydrogen currently is produced via steam methane reforming. And uh, electrolysis is only sort of 5% at this point in time. But um, that ratio is going to be changing as we go forward. And I think the key thing today is to understand that we're on a, on a pathway that can take us from where we are today to where we can be in future. Um, moving from from one to the other water electrolysis i'm sure a lot of you on this call are already very familiar with this but in case you're not this is the kind of stuff that they do as bench tests in year one of gcse at this point in time school kids are doing this up and down the country as we speak um, so this is a beaker of slightly salted water an anode and a cathode run a current between um, through that uh, water and you can generate hydrogen and oxygen. You can trap and store your hydrogen and you can lose your oxygen. Um, you can trap and store it, it is medical grade. There isn't a market for that as yet, but there could be in future. Um, and then again, go, going to the non-academics in the room, if you remember doing this at school, you could tell it was hydrogen by doing the squeaky cop test. Okay, let's move on. Um, so the static stations in the UK that are currently existing for hydrogen refueling, um, the majority of them are using exactly that same water electrolysis process, but on a much bigger scale. Um, so we're using uh, renewable energy, um, either produced on site or, or locally produced energy and uh, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, storing that hydrogen, pressurising it up and then dispensing it into vehicles at this point in time. There's a couple that are using the industrially processed gases and, and transporting that in. But again, I think the point here is that you've got that flexibility in terms of where we are today and where we can go in future. And I really like this infographic. I stole it without shame from newenergytreasure.com. Um, but I really like this. So I think this, this really shows that um, electricity and hydrogen are symbiotic. And um, of course, we want to step away from fossil fuels. And we want to make more of our renewables and um, hydrogen offers this really useful energy mechanism, this uh, energy store to be able to, to run those conversions in, in the both directions. Um, I think that one of the questions I've seen coming through is about um, uh, some thought about uh, how some people think that using the renewables to generate hydrogen isn't necessarily the best use of it i would argue that we lose uh between one and two terawatts of energy every year in the uk from offshore uh wind assets alone that are curtailed and that's enough energy to pretty much run the entire transport for london network so you know it may not be the most efficient use of um, energy in the world however we're currently just losing it by not you know tapping into that as a source and that strikes me as being not necessarily the best way forward so um, moving on then, um, so using um, hydrogen via a fuel cell, it's just electrical energy. So anything that you can power with electricity, you can power with hydrogen. Um, power is power is power. It's, it's that simple. So that can be anything from, you know, battery charging units at the bottom there, forklift trucks, um, large units for buildings, buses, cars, anything. And um, there are multiple different types of fuel cell. And um, so there's uh, different types of technology and there's also different fuel types. The fuel type tends to be hydrogen um, itself or a hydrogen rich um, fuel. So you're looking at, you know, methanol's got quite a lot of hydrogen attached to it and you know, propane, biogas, natural gas, all of those. It's, it's the hydrogen part predominantly that um, is the, the part that's interesting to the fuel cell, the part that takes part in the reactions predominantly. So to put that in a, in a different um, context then, uh, I've just 
uh, put power range across the top there and then the type of fuel, then the technology type and then sort of the type of power and then the application on this sort of grid. Um, so if we look at the very top end of the sort of power ranges at this point in time, you can see there that the fuel that you tend to use for that um, amount of power is um, natural gas. And this is largely because of the volume of gases required. So chucking in that much hydrogen at this point in time is just impractical. Um, but there is a thought that pipelines could go from natural gas to hydrogen or certainly could accept a higher a percentage of hydrogen within the, the natural gas grid. Um, and the fuel cells will be fine with that as they currently are. And then there's scope to, to shift that technology over. It's not like a million miles away to take it from natural gas into pure hydrogen. Um, but as of today, larger fuel cells would be natural gas. And that's because of the, the fueling rather than the fuel cell. This, tends to be used in um, larger buildings, things like uh, the Walkie Talkie building in London, 20th Church Street, and uh, the Transport for London head offices have one as well. Um, you know, the reason why you'd bother though is because if we look at that graph, the emissions are on the floor compared to other technology types that um, are using the same fuel source. So that's why you'd bother. So going, jumping from the very large to the very small. Now, this is um, as, a, as a commercial business, this is where the majority of our business lands at this point in time. So this is typically a little bit of power somewhere far away from the grid. And what we find is that there's um, a range of products available uh, within this sort of, you know, sub a kilowatt kind of uh, power range. Um, we are not tied to any of them, um, but we deploy the, the, the system that's most applicable to um, the power needs. So that's that, about that matching up um, process, which is about the power. It's about the, um, the cycles of power as well. Um, and it's about the fueling strategy. Um, and of course, cost comes into that as well. The good news is that um, these are commercially viable um, today without any subsidies, hence why we as a business, we're, we're spending our time um, deploying these. Um, so they are more expensive up front, but because they require less maintenance, um, you on a whole of life basis, you have um, a payback. And fueling of these is, is manageable at this point in time because it's sort of small amounts of fuel. So if it's a methanol type, we, we get in um, very pure methanol in, in uh, robust canisters. Those can be shipped globally. Uh, similarly, hydrogen is available in sort of more consumer type um, canisters as well. Um, and obviously propane, we've, we've all seen canisters at, at garages and, and, and the like. So it's, it's all possible at this power range, not a problem. These are some of our commercial applications. So um, the, the sort of black box in the middle, uh, that is a box of power that has been used by the BBC for Spring Watch and Winter Watch. Uh, the grey cabinet next to it is an installation uh, for some railway signals. The um, interesting snowy one at the bottom is actually a fuel cell uh, on the top of a mountain range on the island of South Georgia in the Antarctic. Uh, that's a radio repeater station so that two helicopters can talk to each other across either side of that mountain range. So all sorts of um, different you know little bits of power far far away sort of thing um we get involved in and as i say they are commercially viable today and they they're filling a really useful role in um in these very sort of niche markets so then we come on to this sort of center section which is sort of everything from a kilowatt up to 200 kilowatts and typically what we're seeing here is that it, they are hydrogen fueled so it's a, it's a pem fuel cell typically um and we're looking for for pure hydrogen and um, so this is a power for, for smaller buildings or potentially server rooms, um, although that's expensive at the moment. Um, all of the transport applications, you know, the cars tend to be 100 kilowatts, the buses are coming up between 100 and 200 kilowatts. Um, so everything, everything that's really sort of interesting sits within this section. Um, so this is our education centre. This is actually currently based at the Honda plant in Swindon, and we will be moving it as the Honda plant closes, which is very sad, but um, that will be redeployed. Um, that is a, a three kilowatt fuel cell installation. The key thing here is that there was hydrogen already available on site for the fueling station that is there. Um, so we could take a, you know, tap into the feed uh, for that fueling station and just take a small amount to power the, um, the, the little building next door. 
But the key thing was the fuel was there. And once you've got hydrogen, you can do interesting stuff with it. Similarly, um, we did a, a sort of a, a mini grid system for um, the uh, Rotherham installation there, again, linked to a, a, filling, um, a filling station. So on-site electrolyzer powered by wind turbine and then um, the fuel cell sat alongside that as part of it, 36 kilowatts of power. Again, hydrogen was available on site and that's the key for making that work. So fuel cell vehicles then. Um, obviously, we've had uh, recent news that the plan is to um, stop sales of petrol and diesel cars by 2030. Um, and these are pictures of the, the three most uh, common fuel cell vehicles at this point in time. So they're passenger cars. That's the Honda Clarity, the white one, and that is um, very popular in Japan and in California. Uh, we also have the Toyota Mirai, again, very popular in Japan, California and in, into Europe as well. Um, and the Hyundai Nexo uh, that has uh, launched within the UK. There's a, a few in the UK, there's more within Europe and also more within Korea as well. The good thing for the car manufacturers or, or any vehicle manufacturers is that um, there's quite a lot of symbiosis between um, battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles in terms of the drivetrain. Turns out an electric motor doesn't give us stuff where it gets its electrons from, whether you've um, you know, plugged it into the wall and, and pulled them from grid, um, and store them on board in a battery or whether you generate your own electrons on board using hydrogen through a fuel cell. The drivetrain itself doesn't care. And that's a good thing in terms of manufacture because um, with so many of those components being um, similar, it means that, well, one anticipates that uh, costs can come down between the two and you know, there's a, it becomes a horses for courses type thing rather than being an either or scenario. Speaking of which, <clears throat> um, this is looking at the, um, the power required, um, the weight, uh, average kilometres. So anything that's sort of little, um, so like a single passenger car, if you as a, as a family or as an individual, if you have um, the opportunity to charge a vehicle at home or at work and, you, um, uh, and your normal sort of daily routine would um, be covered by the, the range, then a battery vehicle probably makes sense. And it's not for me to say that's no good. I, I think, you know, great, do it. Um, however, the minute you start doing more miles, um, then the hydrogen starts to come into its own a bit. So anything like uh, fleet operations, for example, anything 24-7. Um, so, you know, as a fleet manager, you will be tasked to make the most of your vehicle assets. And that doesn't include having the half of them on charge at any one point in time especially for things like taxi companies, logistics, emergency services, things like that. So there, there will be a requirement for um, that uh, upper limit. So at the moment, we're seeing typically between three and 400 miles from one full tank of gas for a hydrogen vehicle. Um, and then as we start moving up, we've, um, we've seen uh, hydrogen buses start to come through. Um, and we talked previously about um, the, uh, the weight and volume of batteries um, starting to impinge upon the usefulness of the vehicle. So a single decker bus can be run quite happily from a battery. Great, if that works for you. However, a double decker bus, batteries start to top out quite quickly and you start to lose too much um, uh, weight and room um, from the battery packs required. So hydrogen starts to come into its own for uh, double deckers, which is useful. And then into HGVs, there's a potential there, potentially into trains. We've been looking at electrifying the train rather than electrifying the track. For more rural routes and then you know i think we mentioned as well that there's a there's a piece further out for certainly the the larger heavier things that i don't think we've quite got an answer for yet but there's people working on it all the time so for hydrogen to be useful as um as a fuel needs to be available the right time the right place the right volume the right pressure the right purity and it needs to be safe and everyone who works within within this industry is particularly concerned about safety first. Um, it is the first thing we do in, in any sort of site risk assessment. You know, it, it is integral to everything we do. I don't know a single person within this industry. I've been in it for 16 years. I don't know a single person who plays fast and loose with hydrogen. So in terms of purity, um, the fuel cell does care about how pure the um, hydrogen is. It typically needs five nines or 99.999% um, pure hydrogen. 
Um, and how we get there is going to depend on that production method earlier. So we, we talked about both steam methane reforming and also electrolysis. Now, electrolysis is a really clean way of producing hydrogen. Typically, you just need a little bit of drying and it's, it's good to go. Um, there are more steps involved with cleaning up the um, the hydrogen produced from steam methane reforming, just because there's a few sort of chemical impurities that might uh, poison the fuel cell catalysts on board. And now I'm going to use the term volume incredibly unscientifically, and I beg your forgiveness for this one. Um, but it's because we're trying to, you know, do I talk about molecules? Do I talk about kilograms? Do I talk about, it's one of those things. So I'm going to use the layman's terms and pray that you'll forgive me. So for me, uh, for the end application, it seems intuitive that a train is going to need more than a bus, that will need more than a car on board. And that's why we get the different storage tanks that you can see in the middle there. Um, so typically, you know, you, if you've got a lot of enough space, you can use a, use a larger tank, physically larger tank. Um, if you're trying to cram as much um, fuel on board, then a smaller tank at a higher pressure is going to be more appropriate. And so, again, it, it becomes a bit of a Rubik's Cube of a problem. And it's about finding that sweet spot that works for your own application. And then how many vehicles and what their onboard storage is um, will then determine how you feed that hydrogen into um, your fleet, whatever they may be. So if your vehicles are coming back to base, that potentially lends itself to one solution. If your vehicle is going to be traveling all around the UK, that might be more problematic. Um, if you know, looking at trains, for example, um, you're probably looking at hubs to try and um, dispense hydrogen at, at suitable locations. And th then it's about, OK, so how do we get that hydrogen to the fueling place? And there are um, solutions there already. So you can truck hydrogen on tube trailers. Um, you can also produce on site if you've got a source of energy, uh, the renewables or whatever um, on site would be uh, useful. But um, it's, so it becomes more of a logistics thing. And again, it's a Rubik's Cube and it's about turning your dials until you find something that's going to make sense for your application. And then we need to think about pressure as well. So typically at the moment, you know, hydrogen uh, ambient pressure is a bit pointless. <laughs> um, but to use it um, sensibly, it needs to be compressed as a gas. Um, I'm not going to go into liquid here. I could we don't tend to deploy liquid at the moment. Um, I can see that it might have a, a role in future. Um, but as of today, the majority of transport applications are all about gaseous uh, pressurized hydrogen. So um, you can see from the, the diagram here that, that if you have the same amount of molecules, but in a smaller space, then that's a higher pressure material. That's what I'm trying to get out of that one. And that process takes a bit of energy and it also takes some time. And in terms of uh, refueling solutions, that time is actually quite critical because uh, we need to think about how much hydrogen is um, on site and how quickly we can recompress it so that we're ready to fill again. So typically, um, the, uh, the larger type vehicles, um, the buses and trains and, and even planes are using 350 bar um, tanks uh, and the scooters and passenger cars where you really want that extended range are typically using 700 bar. Uh, forklifts are using 350 because they're, they're based, you know, they've got a base and they can refuel more quickly so they don't need the extended range. Um, you can see the difference in the two tank cutaways there um, to create a 700 bar tank. You know, you need quite a lot more <laughs> to keep it in place. Um, so you literally need a lot more material to um, and more processing to, to get that tank uh, to be robust enough for, for that kind of pressure. I mean, 700 bar is about 10,000 PSI. So, you know, it, it's fairly high pressure. Um, but similarly, all of the components involved within 700 bar are that much more expensive than 350 bar. So again, it's a bit of a trade-off between uh, what range do I need and the, the cost associated with that. You know, there's a value associated with that range. Does that value, you know, justify the, the, the added expense? Um, on the components. So to dispense hydrogen then, um, because it's weird, all gases are just weird compared to liquids. And I think we're so used as a population to thinking about liquid fuels because we handle them, you know, daily pretty much. You know, they they abide by the laws of gravity and they fill a, a vessel um, to the edges, you know, 
we're, we're used to it. It feels in, intuitive when you can sort of pour a liquid from one thing to another. Gases are not like that. And it's sort of an odd thing for to get your head around. So I tend to talk to people about balloons <laughs> initially because I'm not a scientist. <laughs> That's wrong, which is. Um, but I tend to say if you can imagine a big balloon full of high pressure, anything could be air, could be gas, whatever, and a small balloon with hardly anything in it. And if you were to um, sort of stick them together at the neck and stand back with a little bit of time, that uh, pressure would equilibrate between the two and um, you'd end up with a, a fuller small balloon. And this is essentially what's happening at the large filling stations is that you're taking a large store and you're cascade filling into a smaller tank. And that means that you can do it quickly if you're working with that pressure differential. So these are um, a couple of examples of uh, hydrogen fueling stations. Uh, there's more coming. Um, we've got about 12 uh, in the UK currently, um, and they're starting to appear on shell forecourts, which is quite exciting. So um, yeah, it's coming. It's just not happening quick enough, is the point. Uh, we do just don't have enough um, gas available. And that's where the car manufacturers have realised as well, that the issue isn't the fuel cell. The cars are brilliant. They work straight out the gate, do what they're meant to. The issue is the fuel. Where are we going to get the fuel from? So um, fuel cell systems have come up with um, a spectrum of refueling products, uh, which we think can help to fill the gap between where we are today and where we want to be in future. And that's everything from a teeny tiny sort of jerry can style right up to the full static stations. So I'm just going to whip through a few examples of, of products that we've uh, introduced. So our first one is the hydrogen jerry can, our mini hydrogen dispenser. Um, this can give a a gas burst, if you like, a puff of gas to get um, a stranded vehicle onto the, the next fueling station. And uh, we've been working with the AA and they have installed um, one of these into their zero emission um, vehicle support van um, alongside a fast charge battery recharger so that they can um, assist any zero emission vehicle roadside. And we use this when the Nexo launched in the UK. Uh, we actually were trailing the Nexo as it did an, a thousand mile journey and they did run out and we did have to give them a puff of gas in a lay by in the dead of night. It was freezing, um, but we did it and it worked perfectly. It does, it does what it's meant to do. Um, next on the list would be our high van solution. Now we haven't actually made this yet, but we've got plans in place. And the minute we get a, a firm purchase order as opposed to our multiple inquiries on this one, we are going to be good to go on it. Um, so we've got a number of configurations uh, depending on um, what hydrogen is needed and where, but we think this is going to be a really helpful um, interim solution. Um, the high cube is something that we've put together recently as well. Um, this is dispensing. It is not to do with hydrogen production. Um, most of our stuff is about dispensing rather than production. We, we do get involved in uh, some electrolyzer um, installations as well, but uh, mostly because things like MCPs, the sort of banks of uh, red cylinders you can see on those pictures, and tube trailers tend to come in at around 200 bar. And typically the installations are wanting either 350 or um, 700 bar. Uh, you need an interim step to compress and... Ah, oh, that's my timer to tell me I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, so... Yeah, you need an interim step to, to dispense at the, at the required pressure. So um, this one we've installed for the uh, Hyd Hydroflex train um, that's being trialled at the moment. Uh, this one is a direct boost. So instead of that cascade fill, this is directly boosting um, from a low pressure, um, sorry, from, uh, from storage into the uh, tanks. It's a long, slow fill. So we're doing this overnight. And the reason we've done that is to really strip back on the uh, amount of componentry and the costs associated with it. Um, another product is our hydrogen refueling truck. We're very proud of this one. It's been in service for about three years and it's been used pretty much constantly. Um, so we were refueling the Metropolitan Police um, trial of the uh, Suzuki Bergman scooters. Um, that was in place for 15 months and we did over 500 filling events. That was 700 bar, but teeny tiny tanks. So it didn't fit into the um, the standard filling protocols, but we could amend ours to, to fit. We also used it um, with uh, Toyota when they did their, their John O'Groats to Land's End run. Uh, they filled at Aberdeen, but then the next station down is Rotherham, and that is too far for one tank of fuel, sadly. So we met them in Sunderland and uh, gave them a, a top up there, and, and they made the journey. Very happy with that one. 
We've also built um, another truck. This is 350 bar only, as opposed to going up to 700 bar. Um, this one is to refuel um, the first commercially available um, hydrogen plane. Um, and again, it's it's been doing what it's meant to do, working fine. We have installed an electrolyzer in the green container at the bottom there as well, so they can generate on site. Yeah, that's all going, going very well indeed. We're very pleased with it. And then moving up, um, you can look at containerized solution. And again, it's about matching up um, the equipment required with the hydrogen need and only deploying the requ equipment required for that need at the um, at the instigation to try and keep those capital costs down. But ideally with an eye to the future so that we can be modular and scalable going forward. So that's the full spectrum. I shall leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. How do I stop sharing? There we go, stop sharing. Thank you.